About two years ago, I had to go to a psychiatric facility so I could deal with my depression issues. At this time, I was a 14-year-old girl. I was at the hospital for three days when all of this started. The third day I was there, I woke up with an awful stomach ache. I convinced the nurses to let me stay in from the activities and sleep off the pain. So I'm alone in the hospital, plus the staff, when the patient phone starts ringing. I run over to answer thinking it would be my boyfriend calling, but instead it's a man's voice I don't recognize. Can I talk to Sandra? I was the only patient there, so I said she wasn't there. Oh, alright, thanks. Who is this? The voice sounded a lot like my friend's dad who I had just met the night before during visiting hours. I told him my name, figuring he would recognize it. What are you in for? I told him it was personal. This started to raise red flags for me because I told my friend's dad why I was there the night before. Did you fight to get in here? Like beat up other girls? I said no, and I was quickly becoming creeped out. It took a few more personal questions for me to realize there was no Sandra at the hospital. I wasn't sure on everyone's names, but I definitely hadn't heard Sandra before. I really started becoming uncomfortable and I told him I had to go, and that was that. Visiting hours came around and there's a phone call for me. A man asking for my name, saying it was my dad. But my dad was sitting right next to me. I explained that he called earlier and my dad was pissed. He went over to the phone and demanded to know who was calling. The man didn't say anything and hung up. After a couple of calls asking for me by name, I told the hospital staff. They became very concerned and we weren't allowed to answer the phones for a while. Apparently a convicted rapist had been calling the mental hospital for years, getting names of the girls who answer the phone. He then uses whatever information he learns from the girls and calls back continually posing as their dad or boyfriend. Apparently he even tried to pick up patients a couple of times. The weirdest part is, when you call the hospital you have to know the birthday of the patient you are trying to reach or the staff won't put the call through. So he somehow knew a bunch of crazy teenage girls' info and used it to prey on us when we least expected it. So I live in a pretty quiet part of my city in a small two-bedroom basement apartment with my roommate who was gone for the summer. I stayed here and worked during the summer I do not get out all that often and don't know many people as I moved to the area two years ago. Just this last Saturday night I was doing my usual gaming with some friends I had met on the internet, good friends of mine that I had known since I was 16, when I get this call from a private number. Now I rarely get phone calls from people I know, normally communication is done just by texting. So I pick up and what sounds like a man maybe in his early to mid 40s picks up the phone. The conversation went as follows. Hello? Hey, who is this? Uh, who is this? It's Randy. Sorry, Randy, you got the wrong number. I hang up. About ten minutes later, he calls me again. And so I thought, oh, he must have accidentally dialed my number again. So I ignored it and thought nothing of it, continue enjoying my time with my friends playing some games... Diablo 3 and by now it was about 9pm and 9.30. Around 10pm I get the call again. Being the not really giving a shit kind of guy I just ignored it again. After all I don't know anyone and I have not known anyone in my lifetime by the name of Randy. Pretty logical to not answer I would just be wasting my time I thought. About an hour and a half passes by. It's about 11pm now. I get the call yet again. So I answered and literally the call goes exactly the same way as before. With one problem, I think I ended up saying too much. I added to the conversation, Sorry, you really have the wrong number. I don't know any Randys. Oh, you don't know me. Yeah, that's right. Well then, I guess I'm going to stop by, and I think you'll get a pretty good idea of who I am when I'm done with you. At this point, I was instantly freaked out, and I just hung up. I was getting kind of scared, 
but I got a grip on myself and just figured that he must have had beef with someone and just doesn't get that he's calling the wrong person. A few minutes later, I hear a vehicle pull into my driveway. Since I live in the basement and there is a window facing the driveway, his headlights were shining right in. I figured it was my neighbor coming home from his night shift at the hospital. I live in a tripleplex. A few minutes pass by and the lights are still on. Quickly, it all came flooding back into my mind. It's him, I thought, and my stomach began to knot and I felt so afraid my hands began to tremble. I peeked through the curtains and watched the car for quite some time. I couldn't tell if there was anyone inside or not since the headlights were bright. He doesn't leave so I called my brother who lives not far from me. I told him what happened and he said, Okay, stay in the house, keep the door locked, I'm coming to get you man. Now my brother's a pretty intimidating guy if you've never met him before. Six foot four, broad shoulders, big badass looking beard, etc. He comes up, I let him in and he says, There's nobody in the car dude. Yet the headlights are on. I pack up some things and we head off. He was kind enough to let me stay at his place for a few days until I felt okay. Upon returning to my apartment today, the same vehicle is in my driveway. I started freaking out, but there's nobody in the car. I noticed blankets on all the seats. For some reason, I looked in the opposite direction, right at my garbage bin, and written directly on the side, it says, It's me. I quickly went into my apartment and locked the door and took a shower. When I got out, the car was gone. Now I'm writing this. Honestly, I'm pretty fucking scared right now. I was still living in an apartment with my two older sisters. We're all in our early 20s in a shady area in the city here in the Philippines. And by shady, I mean neighbors who use drugs, gangsters roaming around like they own the streets, riots in the middle of the night. Yeah, you get the picture. I know this isn't a good place for three girls to live, but we really don't have a choice since the rent is really cheap and the money's tight. So on to the story. My sisters were already sleeping that night and I was still up studying for the upcoming finals when our landline suddenly started ringing. I was kind of annoyed more than puzzled as to why on earth someone still calling in the middle of the night. I didn't move to answer the call and just focused harder on what I am reading. The caller would hang up after like five rings then try to call again. It was already hard to focus at that time because the ringing was already getting into my head so I promised myself to answer the next call. So when the phone rang, I answered it immediately. I asked who the caller is, but there was no answer. All I could hear was heavy breathing and random noise on some street. I shrugged it off, hung up, and went back to studying. The call stopped and for once I could finally start studying in peace. After several minutes, I got sleepy and prepared to go to bed when my phone started freaking ringing again. I ignored it and continued cleaning up my stuff. The call went to voicemail, and the caller left a message. Look outside. I'm outside your door. I'm outside as I speak to you right now. Just take a look outside at me. The voice was breathy, but it was obvious that the caller was a guy. He uttered those words with a sing-songy voice like he was a maniac on the loose. I was creeped the fuck out, nevertheless. I woke up my sisters and told them what had happened. We were all freaked out. We don't know what to do since there isn't a 911 hotline here in the Philippines you could call any time, nor a team of policemen who would respond immediately. So we just secured the locks and stayed awake together all night, holding one another with knives in our hands. Fortunately, nothing terrible happened and the creeper didn't call again, but that was enough to make us move the fuck out of that place. Back in 8th grade, probably halfway through the school year, I received a phone call from an unknown caller. Usually, I wouldn't answer for a number I didn't recognize, or sometimes I would do so in an accent, but I would always hang up after a second or two. Things changed, however, when the second I answered, I heard a man saying my full name in a questioning tone, like as if he was asking for confirmation that it was me. 
being just a kid and thinking this was one of my parents' friends or someone I could talk to, I told him that it was me. Big mistake, but I didn't know at the time. That first phone call I don't remember much of, except that he hung up not long after I said that was me. Some time passed, maybe less than a week, when I got an unknown call again. I didn't answer, and then I kept getting spam calls. So I finally answered and this guy was asking me which shows I like to watch. I got the idea that maybe I shouldn't be talking to this guy so I just immediately hung up. Not much long after, another couple of calls came in until I said to stop calling me and he responded to something of the effect of hanging up mid-conversation is rude. My dad heard me and asked who I was talking to so I told him I didn't know and handed him the phone. My dad asked who this was and to stop calling my number in his angry dad tone. Then he got a confused face for a second before getting really angry and shouting at them before they abruptly hung up. My dad later told me that this person knew my father's name and he told him, don't be so angry, before hanging up. Pretty soon these calls would happen at least once a day and I would almost always hand the phone to my dad for him to yell at the guy. We told all our friends and family to stop if they were prank calling me. We tried getting police involved and we also contacted my middle school saying there was a guy being creepy with me. The guy never called during school hours and he would usually call at first when I was home alone, but soon switched it up to calling around the time my father got home from work. This guy sounded young. For a long time we thought my uncles or their friends were playing pranks on us. He sounded maybe mid to late 20s and sounded sort of Latino. Never had an angry tone and never said anything malicious, but he was a stalker and he knew the names of my parents, sister, my dogs, some cousins and my grandparents. He never called when we had company over and it was never after 8pm. At one point I was sitting in my room and got a call. By this point it was nearing the last few weeks of school and because this guy never said anything bad and police said there was nothing to do, I just answered the phone and asked what he wanted. I remember clear as day he was listing off video games, Red Dead Redemption, Modern Warfare 2, Halo 3, etc. I looked at my disc stand and saw he was reading off the list in order that my games were, top to bottom. I stood up and looked out the window, but nobody was there. After the list was done I just stood there and he told me something about having good taste in games and that we should play some time. At this moment I was scared shitless. I cried and called my dad. He came home early and we realized like idiots that we could just change my number. We changed my number and I purged my Facebook account and we all set our accounts to private. Maybe six months later we moved and after changing the number I never got any calls from this guy. The reason I came to tell this story is because I've been getting unknown numbers calling me for the past couple of days and I never answered them anymore but telling my girlfriend about it, she reminded me about that guy. So, needless to say, I will be changing my number soon as a precaution. A good friend of mine and I went to college together and stayed in the same dorms. It wasn't uncommon for the dorm phones to ring with drunk dialers or just plain misdials. The dorm phone numbers were all very similar and generally the person in the room would change from year to year. This particular friend of mine is athletic and very good at the cold shoulder, so for the most part he has never had an issue with creepers. She picks up the phone one night about 3am and there's a man on the other end of the phone. He identified himself by first name very readily and I think it was Joe. He asked for some other girl's name and she informed him rather sleepily that he had the wrong number and no such girl lived there. He asks what her name is, she gives it, and he asks the standard, So, what are you wearing? She informs him, flannel PJs, and bids him a good night. She thinks this is the end of it. The next night, at about 3am again, the phone rings and he asks for her by name. She informs him that she has no interest in speaking with him and to not call again. However, he doesn't stop. He keeps calling night after night. This is particularly worrisome because the dorm phone numbers are formatted such that you can get a good idea of where a room is by the number and vice versa. 
She speaks with a friend of the family who is a cop who agrees to put a trace unit on the phone. Her relationship with her roommate isn't above cordial so the roommate doesn't understand that the trace item needs to stay plugged in because this is a legitimate issue. Fast forward to winter break. My friend and I are the only two people we're aware of in the dorms. She's spending time in my room but needs to go grab something in her room. While in her room for those brief minutes the phone rings. The call trace unit isn't plugged in. She's afraid he is calling because he could see her room lights on from the street. At this time I notice a man walking through the hallways. Since that night I have never known if there was someone caring for the dorms doing a round or a legitimate creeper roaming around. Fortunately though my friend no longer picking up the phone seemed to do the trick. She's still spooked by men who sound like Joe and has never felt quite as safe as before. When I was 22, I moved a thousand miles away from my Midwest home to the beautiful foothills of Tennessee. I had a new job, new car, and a nice apartment, but didn't know a soul outside of work. If my phone rang, I expected to hear a faraway family member or my long-distance boyfriend who was still in college. This was a landline, no cell phones yet. Despite being very alone, I was managing well with the excitement of all the new things in my life. I had only lived there about two weeks when the unwanted calls started. The first call, a man's friendly voice asked what I was doing. I couldn't place him and thought maybe it was one of my cousins or uncles. I have a huge extended family. I ask him his name, he laughs a little and his tone gets dark, a bit angry and he says, You know exactly who this is, darling. I pause, deciding if this guy simply called the wrong number or is a creep. I choose the former, laugh, and politely tell him he has the wrong number. He then recites my brand new, unlisted, unpublished phone number and my name. What the fuck, I thought. An intense chill races through me. I've only given my new number to my parents, sister, boyfriend, apartment manager, and employer. I'm new to the city and this lovely southern state. He does not like it that I tell him he called the wrong number and starts yelling at me, then tells me in a much calmer voice the many vulgar things he's going to do to me. I hang up and brush it off. He calls again around 1am. I tell him to screw himself and hang up. He keeps calling, so I unplug the phone and return to sleep. However, as days go by the calls continue and escalate. He starts mentioning personal things about me, said he liked the white quilt on my bed, knew what was in my fridge that he's allergic to cats, I had one, and then asked me if I was in love with Mary. As I listened to his words, I was standing in my kitchen looking at the calendar taped to the fridge. It had Mary written in pink on the 17th with a heart around it because Mary is my sister and the 17th is her birthday. I started shaking and crying because suddenly I realized this creep has been in my apartment. I was alone with no friends or family to run to for the night. It was me versus a creepy mystery man. I didn't sleep much that night. Early the next morning I talked to the apartment complex manager before heading to work, telling her what had happened and that I want the locks changed that day. She gets a weird look on her face and after a long pause she says she knows who's been in my apartment and that it won't happen again. What? I thought to myself. It turns out she had a creepy, rapey maintenance guy who noticed a young woman moving into an apartment alone and that I was his new pet. She had the locks changed immediately and promised that she would personally keep the other key. Although the calls stopped, I was paranoid for a year as I came and went from my apartment because I never even knew what this guy looked like. I moved out the moment my lease was up. Only after thinking about it years later did I realize that her weird expression likely meant that it had happened before. Plus, she didn't even fire him. I regret not calling the cops. I was young and naive. I am a female and I was 20 years old at the time living in an apartment with my mom and little brother while I attended community college. When we first moved in, the apartments were very well run. 
and within a short period of time the manager was transferred elsewhere and his replacement did not have his skill at keeping undesirable types out. The police became a regular sight in our neighborhood and it was a rare day that would go by without seeing them. The woman who moved in downstairs from us began openly dealing drugs. People would come and go at all hours and leave little bags of various substances in their pockets, mostly weed but definitely other stuff as well. They could not have been more obvious if they tried, and there was always a crowd of shady-looking men with large, unfriendly dogs hanging around the yard or even sitting on our stairs. They'd act like it was a personal insult if we interrupted them to walk up or down our stairs and would be generally quite intimidating. The breaking point didn't come until their customers started getting the wrong address and coming to our door instead. We'd be sitting in the living room and hear footsteps come up the stairs, and the doorknob would turn and jiggle against the lock. We became religious about keeping the door locked tight. One night I was home alone, and somebody started just beating on the door, not knocking. It was more like he thought it was a punching bag, all the while screaming barely comprehensible obscenities. I grabbed the biggest butcher knife out of the kitchen and shouted through the door that I was calling 911, and he ran away. In hindsight, I probably should have actually called, but I was just relieved he'd gone, and since I hadn't seen what he looked like at all, I figured it wouldn't be much use. After that, though, I always pushed the couch in front of the door before I went to bed. Mom had had enough. She tried going to the manager first and was met with a total lack of interest from her, so she decided there was nothing to be done but contact the police about it herself. So she called about it and got off the phone looking happy because they at least seemed to take her seriously and promised to investigate. The first sign of trouble came the next night. There was a lot of thumping and bumping downstairs, and a peek out the window showed people going in and out of the apartment carrying cardboard boxes to a dented van on the street. Bright and early the next morning, the police raided the place, and you guessed it, clean as a whistle. At first, we didn't realize the implications. When it started back up again a few days later, Mom called the cops again, and the same thing happened. At this point, we realized it probably wasn't a coincidence. Somebody in the local police department was most likely tipping them off, one of the curses of a small town. I was angry and disappointed, but at least we tried, right? It never hurt to try. Well, I wish. About a week later, I was getting ready for an evening class. I'd just gotten out of the shower, and I was in my bedroom in a bathrobe, picking out what I wanted to wear. I heard a loud banging on the front door but didn't think much of it. We'd been expecting a package and the UPS man always knock loudly. My mom's footsteps went to answer it and I hear her say something. I couldn't make out the words but her tone caught my attention and I felt like something was wrong. I reached for my door but before I could open it, it flew open in my face. All my shocked brain could grasp was huge man with gun in my bedroom before I was grabbed by the shoulders and flung to the floor. I honestly thought the druggies downstairs had come to get us once and for all. I thought I was about to be raped and murdered. At this point I should mention I've had an issue with one of my wrists for years due to a childhood injury. I've had it operated on twice and this was not more than a few months after the second operation. Naturally, I managed to land with my full weight on that wrist and something crunched horribly. I did what any tough person would do and immediately burst into tears and sat there clutching my wrist waiting to die. I guess I must not have looked very threatening like that because he stepped back a bit and that's when I saw the police on the front of his vest. The next few minutes were a bit of a blur. Somehow I was herded out into my living room where my mom was and the cop left without saying anything more than wait here. I was completely dazed. My mom was pretty much having hysterics and there was all kinds of shouting and activity going on outside. After a short while, the cop returned and informed us, to paraphrase, Sorry, wrong address. Shit happens, we can't be perfect all the time. My name is Officer Schinken. Here's my card. You call if you have any questions. And he left. I went straight to the emergency room and spent the next two hours getting my wrist x-rayed and put into a splint and then I went to my math class because I didn't know what else to do, and I was terrified of being at home. Needless to say, I learned nothing whatsoever, but the support of my teacher and classmates was reassuring. The next morning, somebody knocked on the door. My mom answered. It was Officer Schinken again. 
When I heard his voice, I started hyperventilating and went and hid in the bathroom, so I didn't hear what was said, but I heard my mom slam the door. She was absolutely furious. I had never seen her look so angry. Apparently, good old officer Shinken had brought along a carefully prepared document he'd wished for us to sign that basically said we understood that it was all a terrible mistake and that we would not be seeking legal action. She told him to go to hell and shut the door in his face. Ten minutes later, the phone rang. It was one of the nurses at the emergency room saying somebody claiming to be law enforcement had just come by trying to get copies of my ER visit records, but they didn't have permission to release those, and if I wanted them to have them, I'd have to come and sign the forms. Oh, hell no. Further questions revealed that yes, the man matched Officer Shinken's description, and furthermore, he had told the nurse that he was not the officer involved, but was investigating the incident. I started to find that pretty much everyone I told the story to would get a funny look on their face and say, this cop, was his name Officer Schenken? And then they would launch into their own horror story about him. My high school teacher said he shot one of her former students during a marijuana bust and left him on the ground to bleed to death, but the other officer on the scene did first aid and saved his life. One of our neighbors said he dragged said neighbor's disabled uncle down a flight of stairs by his feet, hitting his head on every concrete step. Another neighbor said Officer Shinken pulled him out of the shower by his hair and held a gun to his head over a parole violation. And Google said he's once been fired from a nearby city for shooting a handcuffed man in the head, killing him. He claimed it was somehow self-defense and was fired but never charged with any crime. The medical bills for the ER visit and such ended up being over seven grand, and I didn't have insurance, so I basically had no choice but to file a suit. I found myself a lawyer and submitted a claim, and that's when the shit really hit the fan. We started getting disturbing phone calls at all hours of the night, sometimes just silence at the other end, or the phone of somebody breathing and sometimes graphically sexual comments. When we stopped answering the phone, they just let it ring until the machine picked up, then immediately hang up and do it again. My mom went to her car one morning and opened the door, only to discover the handle had been coated in some kind of caustic chemical. She washed it off quickly but still ended up with burns and an emergency room visit. I'd just gotten my permit and was out for driving practice when it began to rain so I went down the highway. I flipped on the windshield wipers and discovered they'd been coated with grimy motor oil it smeared across the windshield and completely obscured my vision. Fortunately, the road was empty enough I was able to slam the brakes and pull to the side without getting into an accident. Other things started to happen too, less severe but sinister given the context above. Somebody cut out a bunch of metal militia skulls designs and tacked them onto our wall or pushed them under the door at night. What the fuck, I still have no idea what they were supposed to accomplish. Furniture was stolen off the porch, my boots vanished when I left them out there and, oddly, several pounds of weed in a plastic sack appeared on our porch one morning. My mom called the manager to get it without going outside. For once in her life, the lady did something useful and actually fetched it and threw it in the dumpster. I have never felt so helpless in my life. What was I going to do? Call the police, I thought? It was around this time that a friend who lived abroad suggested I come stay with him for a while for my own safety. I dropped out of school and left the country for six months while the lawsuit worked its way through the courts. My mother and brother moved in with my family and then to another town without submitting a forwarding address. Eventually my tourist visa ran out and I had to come home. I was a complete nervous wreck and I ended up settling out of court for a relatively small sum of money just to make it be over. My lawyer got a copy of the search warrant they used. It was riddled with grammatical errors and switched between my apartment number, 18, and the number of the unit down the street, 25, at random. The suspect was somebody with an entirely different name who looked entirely different from any of us and who had apparently sold some Oxycontin pills. She lived in unit 25. I saw a copy of her driver's license. It said right on the front of it, in nice clear letters, Unit 25 as her address. I don't know. I have no proof, but it was obvious that somebody had been tipping off our drug dealers downstairs and often wonder if the wrong number on that warrant was not a mistake at all. 
Perhaps it was meant as retaliation for trying to get their friends in trouble. I have now gained full use of my hand, which my doctor had told me might never happen. I no longer have a heart attack at loud noises, and I only feel slightly uneasy when I see police uniforms, rather than having full-on panic attacks. It's six years later, and I'm now only beginning to reclaim my life, kick the PTSD, and going back to finish school. I feel like I lost the best part of my 20s to those jerks, and I'm still bitter about it. I currently live with friends in an informal situation. My real address is not on any documentation, and I get all my mail in a P.O. box in another town. Depending on which document you're looking at, I supposedly live in five different places scattered from one end of the county to the other. And I'm not going to change that until I move a lot further away from where all this happened. I used to work at a call center that handled the customer service calls for a very popular makeup brand. The department was made up of 40 women and maybe 3 men. We would occasionally get immature, flirty calls that were obvious and dismissed quickly. Overall, getting calls from males was rare. One day I got a call from a man who wanted to know more about makeup. He said he had lost a bet with friends and had to wear a full face of makeup for a week. He was completely normal sounding, even charming. I looked forward to these calls to break up my day so didn't really think much of it. I went through the website with him, going through each category in depth and application. He said he was writing everything down. I spent almost two hours on the phone with him and felt like it was a positive interaction. A few days later at lunch I overheard managers discussing a man who calls in saying he lost a bet, needs makeup advice. He had been calling in for years. In the beginning it was obvious what he was doing loudly masturbating to the woman's voice. Even though his story stayed the same for years, he obviously got better at disguising his intentions. It was much, much more graphic in the first phone calls. Needless to say, I was very, very disturbed that I had been talking to this man for hours and had no idea anything was off. People who are this good at hiding things are some of the most terrifying to me. This happened in the early 90s in Uruguay. My mom started receiving calls as soon as my dad left on a business trip to Spain. Calls were usually at 11pm and at first it was heavy breathing and mumbling. Eventually a muffled voice would say her name and hang up. Things got weird when the calls started to involve my older sister, back then 10 or 11, saying that they were going to wait for her to get out of school and rape her and beat her up. Shit hit the fan one day. My mom would walk her to school daily and wait for her to get into class. When my mom got home, she received a call saying how pretty they look today and describing my sister's outfit saying it'd be a shame that it's going to be covered in blood later. My mom called the police. They eventually found out who it was, but it was never revealed to my mother. I'm not exactly sure why. They said they couldn't reveal the name of the stalker to avoid retaliation. They assured her that everything was under control and that this person would stop bothering us. We never found out who it was, even to this day. At 3.38am I got a text from my mom asking if I was still up. I replied yes and was curious as to what she was wanting since it was a work night for her and she was always in bed early. My father's a firefighter and it was a night he was on shift so I knew he wasn't home. Less than a minute after I replied she called me so I answered it and my mom was very upset, crying actually, and was asking me to come pick her up from home since I only lived two streets away from her so it takes me almost about two minutes to drive to her house. I immediately say yes, throw on my little bluetooth speaker thing I have and started getting dressed, grabbed one of my pistols and proceeded out my door grab my pistol because I'm still unsure what's going on and since I have my concealed carry license it's not uncommon for me to carry. As I'm rushing to get ready I'm asking what's wrong. She tells me that at about 3.28 she got a phone call from a restricted number and answered a phone since it woke her up. Upon answering it she said some guy started talking who she didn't recognize. She's unclear what he initially started saying when she picked up since she was still out of it from just waking up. 
but when alert, she said the man said that he was babysitting a nine-year-old girl named Ashley earlier on, and when she was on the couch with him, he did stuff to her, basically saying he molested her. Obviously, my mom is completely blindsided by what's going on and immediately starts asking who she is speaking to, asking if this is some kind of sick prank call and says don't ever call again and she hangs up. Immediately, the restricted number calls back and tries talking to her again, and again she states this better not be some kind of sick prank and hangs up. So he calls a third time and is saying stuff again though my mom wasn't too sure what he was saying since at this point she was very uncomfortable and headed to the kitchen to turn on all the house lights and grab one of her knives. Again, she hung up. Number calls a fourth time and my mom tells him, Listen up. I'm done playing your games. I'm calling the cops. Who is this? In which she said he angrily replies, No, you listen up. I'm not here to answer your questions. You are here to listen to me. Now you're going to stay on the line and listen to everything I did to this girl. Otherwise, I'm going into her room doing it again. My mom hangs up again and that's when she texts and calls me and stays on the line with her as I'm quickly getting ready and heading over there. While on the line he calls a fifth time in which my mom ignores the call but says that he left a voicemail this time. While on my way there, which again I live a two minute drive away, he calls a sixth and seventh time which my mom ignores and that's when I pull up to the side of her home. Also, not sure if this is some weird coincidence or not, but as I'm about two or three houses down from her is about to pull up is when they stop calling. So that being said, I was still around the corner, so her home wouldn't have even been in sight when they stopped. So she jumps in my car and we drive to the police station. I am also a firefighter from my city, so I knew a cop working and knew I'd rather bring all this up to him as opposed to calling 911 directly. So we get there and explain everything to him. Mom tells him about the voicemail. She says she doesn't want to listen to it and ask the cop if he can and maybe get a sense of what my mom is talking about in regards to this number calling. So the cop listens to it, says it's about 15 seconds long and says, yeah, you probably don't want to listen to that. I asked if it's possible to trace a restricted number since I thought you could but he said he doesn't think you can so he goes back and gets his supervising officer to get his input on what could be done. Supervising officer confirms that a restricted call can't be traced and says unfortunately there's not really anything that can be done. He asks my mom if she either recognized the man's voice, knew a little girl named Ashley, or heard the sounds of a little girl basically crying or struggling on the phone calls, and my mom said no. So therefore there really isn't any way or any reason to get a detective involved. He also suggested that there's probably a strong possibility that this is just some guy fabricating this whole story because this is how this weirdo gets off. Just kind of crazy that out of any random number this dude could call to get off, it happens to be my mom's. The officer said best case scenario, my mom's cell phone provider most likely could trace the call and see the number who it belongs to, but assured us that most likely the phone company would absolutely not give us this info unless we had orders from a judge. So basically we just filed a report and I brought my mom home and waited until my dad got off work in the morning. Has anyone ever heard of something like this happening before? Should I try to get a hold of the phone company and see if I can get any info at all? I'm sure it would put my mom at ease if the number is from like a few states over as opposed to a local number. I don't know. It just seems weird to try and brush this whole thing off and hope they never call my mom again.